action. All right, here we go. We're going to read the first question about the strategic business unit level. I can read it. All right. Prince, go ahead. You're on. Okay. Uh, there are five steps involved in segmenting a... Huh? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll get more time. I'll get more time. Okay. You were just trying to see if I was paying attention, right? Yeah. That was the time. <laughs> You All right, it. I'm paying attention. Go ahead. Go ahead. Business, uh, business unit level at which managers set a more specific strategic direction for their businesses to exploit uh, value creating opportunities is referred to as the strategic business unit level. Right, so the answer is B on page 28. And remember, the acronym is SBU. We talk a lot about SBU, strategic business units. And remember, we said we start with the corporate level, then we go down to the business unit level, and then we focus on the functional level. So the strategic business unit level is very important because we're going to have shared objectives in an organization. So the corporate plan is going to outline the vision, the mission, the values, some key strategies for the organization. And the strategic business units, and we could have three, five, we could have 20 strategic business units. For example, the strategic business units are each going to develop a plan that's going to bring those strategies and goals and objectives that are addressed in the corporate plan. They're going to bring that to life. So we have to have shared objectives within the organization. Because the objectives and the goals and the values that the senior executives talk about in the corporate plan, in of itself, is not something that they operationalize. It's something that the strategic business units take a major role in operationalizing. So it's not enough to say that you're going to be a leader in what? Well, what, what product can we take as an, um, as an example? Prince. Once before we talked about being a leader, being the market share leader in electronic high school educational devices. So, all right, if that's um, what you have as a goal, that's, that's fine. But... How does that become a reality? Then it's up to the individual strategic business units to make that a reality. All right, next question. Number two. Jason, go ahead. Specialized functions such as marketing and finance are generally referred to as departments? Yes. So the organization, remember we said they have three plans, and one of them is going to be the um, functional plans such as marketing and finance, generally we refer to those as departments. You have a marketing department, you have a finance department, a quality department, a human resource department. Those departments also have to work to help achieve the shared objectives for the organization. So remember we said that you have the corporate plan, the business plan, and the functional plan operating simultaneously. It's not one or the other. The company is going to have all three. Questions about that? Does that make sense? All right, third question talks about stakeholders. And you remember we talked about the difference between stakeholders and shareholders. Go ahead, Alan, tell us. The difference or the answer of the question? Either or. Okay, the answer is C. Yeah, so any read that to us. Stakeholders include? Stakeholders include any and all people who are affected by what a company does and how well it performs. Good. So, shareholders 
or an example of stakeholder. Right? So a shareholder or um, suppliers, vendors, customers, for example, those are all stakeholders. So don't mix up the terms stakeholder and stockholder or shareholder. Yes, yeah, stockholders and shareholders, they are stakeholders. They have a vested interest, like Alan is saying, in the performance of the company. And that Johnson & Johnson, for example, this is something that they take very seriously and they talk about in their credo, they talk about the obligations that they have to their stakeholders. And as a company that focuses on delivering healthcare related products and services, they identify some of their stakeholders as being doctors, nurses, um, the community, their customers and their patients, as well as their suppliers, etc., etc. All of those are examples of stakeholders, including the shareholders, and sometimes we use the word stockholders. All of those are examples of stakeholders. Go ahead. Okay, but first let me see GUI, GUI. What do you want to tell us? I just had a question. What is the stockholder? What's the stockholder? People who own stock in the company. Yeah, so if you own stock, sometimes we use the word stock, sometimes we use the word shares in a company. If it's a corporation, then what you do is, um, in order to raise capital, is you sell shares, you sell stock in a company to, um, to get capital. And then those individuals have shares in the organization. That's different from if um, our... Um, capital structure includes debt, which means that we just borrow, we just borrow from Jason fifty million dollars, and we pay interest on the fifty million dollars, and we have to pay back the fifty million dollars um, in a specified time period. Shareholders, we don't have to pay them back, and we don't pay interest, and in fact, we don't even have to pay dividends. So it is definitely um, something that we have to consider when we're trying to raise capital for the organization, is whether or not we're going to um, issue stock, or we're going to issue debt, or we're going to be financed 50% stock, which we refer to as equity, or 50% debt. It depends. What's the, um, why is that an issue? What's the difference? What happens if you're 80% debt? That means 80% of your financing is debt. So Why back. would that be a, an issue? You have to pay it back. Right, you have to pay it back, and your investors might be concerned that you won't be able to pay it back. And we should be concerned about that as well when we issue debt is, are we going to be able to service the debt? which means are we going to be able to make the interest payments and ultimately are we going to ever be able to pay back the principal, the money that we borrowed. So very often companies have um, a capital structure that's partially debt and um, partially equity. And in fact, in accounting, we look at the debt to equity ratio. That's how important it is as a metric in evaluating the performance of a company is what percentage is equity and what percentage is debt. Jacob, go ahead, number four. Uh, often used interchangeable, interchangeably with vision, a B mission statement frequently has an inspirational theme. Right, remember we talked about that on page 29 I said um, the book suggests that vision and mission are terms that are used interchangeably and suggest that um, they're the same thing, but what I cautioned us is to keep in mind that the original intent of the vision was to indicate where it is we want or expect the company to be in the future, whereas the business only defines 
where we operate now. So it's meant to um, define our business as it is today. Whereas here it suggests truth that you know the vision has somewhat of a inspirational or aspirational component in that it's look it's forward looking. So the vision talks about, for example, where we want to be in five years. So today, for example, our mission is a distributor of educational devices to high schools in the United States. But our vision, our vision is to be the market share leader worldwide, so not just the United States anymore, but the market share leader worldwide of educational devices at all educational levels within the next five years. So you see this, um, you certainly could um, argue that there is a difference between vision and mission, although sometimes people use them interchangeably, really the intent was that the vision is um, forward-looking, where we want to be in the future. And that's talked about on page 29. Um, what about number five? Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, mission refers to E, <coughs> statement of organizations, function of society, identifying its customers, markets, products, and technology. Hopefully in that. Right, try saying that three times fast. Yeah. Yes, so the best answer is E. It says a mission refers to a statement of the organization's function in society, often identifying its customers, its markets, its products and technologies. So the example that I gave you, you think that's a good one, a good example of a, of a mission? Did we identify for this um, educational device company that, um, right, that's the product and the market we said is for high school students and the, well the customer, the market is we specifically said in the United States so that's um, one example of a mission. Certainly you could go to uh, pretty much any company and they're gonna have a mission statement that defines uh, their organization. And importantly, the mission is not five pages. It doesn't mean that you can't have a five page document that talks about your business, but the mission is deliberately meant to be short and so that everybody in the organization can internalize that. So if anybody calls, for example, whoever picks up the phone, whether it's somebody who's a senior executive, or somebody who's a manager, or a supervisor, or somebody who um, works in the mail room, whatever it is that their role is within the organization, they should be able to articulate what is the mission of the company. Just like in one sentence, two sentences, basically, what is it that the company does? That's what the mission is. What is it that you guys do here? Everybody should be able to explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so when I was going through the quiz, I knew it was E, but can't it also be C? Like yeah, partially. No, really, the best answer is E. Well, why, why do you think... The best um, one is E, definitely. That's why I circled it, and I did not on the quiz I took it, but can it also be C? Well, the, the, but um, what C talks about is, in terms of dictating behavior, sounds more like a code of ethics, okay. or um, the values of the company, so or some sort of code of conduct that's going to influence, it says here, dictates the behavior of all its employees. That's... Um, not a mission, that's, uh, I mean, that might be one of your goals, is to have all employees behave in an ethical manner, but that's something that's going to come out in, um, very specifically in terms of dictating the behavior of employees, that's some sort of code of conduct or um, code of ethics that says you could, can't do this, you can't accept gifts from suppliers, and so forth, and so on, and so on, and gives examples of specific behavior. 
Number six talks about marketing metrics. All right, so what about number six? Who's going to tell us? <coughs> metrics. What's a metric? Yeah, it's a measure. So we're always looking at um, marketing metrics. Sometimes we use the term indicators. We're trying to determine how we're doing as an organization. We're trying to evaluate our performance. Good, Aaron? E. E. Hmm. What do you guys think? Is it totally wrong? I was going to say. What do the rest of you guys think? <laughs> Wait a minute. Something A, some D, some E? Come on. It's either A through E. I'm not sure. Right. It could, it's either A. I'll tell you this much. Right now, I'm going to give you all the answers to the exam. All right? These are all the answers to the exam. A, B, C, D, E. You have my word. Those are all the answers to the exam. So multiple choice. That's all. Most of them are gonna. Yeah, it's most of it is gonna be multiple guess. And it's and it's different from the exam last semester. I know. I know. Hopefully, this one is easier than last semester. So the best answer is. Do we want to vote on this? You guys want to, you guys want to vote? The best answer is, what do you think? Um, D, really, D. Let me see what this says, D. Mm. That's interesting. D is interesting. For product's performance, based upon input from members of a cross-functional team. Uh, yeah, I, I, see what you're, I, I see what you're thinking there, but that's not the best answer. A, yeah, the best answer is A. It's a measure of the quantitative value or trend of a marketing activity or result. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? A marketing metric, it talks about on page 33. A measure of the quantitative value or trend of a marketing activity or result. So, yeah, Joseph, tell us. It's basically how well their strategy is working. No? Yeah. And so, what would be a good example of a marketing metric? Data, uh, survey. Data, but so what would be, um, what is the data going to tell us? What is the metric, right? What's the, Aaron said measure. What is the measure? How much it went up or down. Well, how, how much what went up and down? How much, how much, how much products were sold, let's say, or? People's awareness. Yeah. How oh, okay, so how much product could be, um, how many units of the product you sold? Exactly. So did you sell 50,000 or did you sell 150,000? And did it go up or down, like you're saying, compared to um, last year or last period? Can you do a survey on people's awareness on certain products so you see if your marketing is working? Well, absolutely. You want to do um, every quarter, and it's expensive to do this, but it's um, important to understand um, the level of brand awareness and to do a, a branding study because if you're spending $50 million a year on advertising, and by the way, that's not even a lot. I mean, there's some companies that spend, for their entire organization and for their portfolio of brands, they spend $500 million a year. But let's say for a given brand, you spend $50 million. How do we know, and that's what, the, this is what we're talking about when we're saying the measure of the quantitative value as it relates to a marketing activity. So if we spend $50 million on advertising, how do we know if it's effective? So we, one of the things that we could do, Joseph is saying, is that we could do um, a branding study and try to measure the level of awareness. So has the level of awareness gone up as a result? I would like to think because at a minimum, our goal for every advertising campaign now, we could have several objectives for an advertising campaign, several goals that we want to achieve, but at a minimum, we want to achieve brand awareness. We want to increase the level of brand awareness. That's, you don't even need to put that in your advertising brief if you're working with an advertising agency. That's just like unspoken. You don't even need to say that. I would still put it in. But, I mean, that's like the minimum requirement is to achieve a higher level of brand awareness. So absolutely, so um, that would be um, worthwhile. And to see the change, like um, Jason is suggesting, over time, whether it's the number of units that were sold, the dollar sales, the level of brand awareness. 
So, of course, it's meaningful to know if your level of brand awareness is 43% or 83%. That's important to know. But also important is to know, well, we were at 43%. Now we're at 55%. So to monitor the change. And presumably, that's a result of the advertising. So we have dollar sales, unit sales, level of brand awareness. What else? What about market share? So dollar sales and unit sales is just, we're just trying to find out if we're achieving the goals that we set for sales. But it doesn't say anything about how we're doing relative to the competition. Now that gets interesting. Like, we might be excited that we sold 50,000 units of the product. They're like, coach, we've done it! Yes! Right? 50,000 containers of orange juice. You think, we're the best team ever. But then you find out that the competition sold 150,000 containers of orange juice. Now that kind of puts it into perspective. You see what I'm saying? And that's what market share is doing. It's saying, for a given category, what percentage of the sales, and we could look at it in terms of dollars and units, what percentage of the sales were carrying our brand name, and what percentage of the sales were carrying the brand name of other companies? So we might have 20% market share, let's say, and another company might have 32% market share, and another company might have 12% market share, and another company might have 12%, another company might have 10%, and how much are we up to now? That's like 80 something, right? Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere around there. And then that gives us a sense of perspective. So that's an, also an important marketing metric, a way to measure our performance. Zach? With market share, what is it of like the country or specific town or grocery store, like, like or it depends on the company? Yeah. Well, um, when you have access to when you purchase syndicated point of sale data, then you could look at it by category. You could look at it by um, channel of distribution. So you could look at well, how many units in grocery stores? did we sell, what percentage of the units sold in grocery stores did we sell versus the competition? So for example, for a given category on a given channel, you have to, it's going to cost approximately $75,000 to get that data. So you know what that data is that we're buying? Is you know when you go into the store and you purchase um, a group of items and they scan them, and it goes beep, beep. When you have the checkout, I don't know how somebody could do be a cashier and do that. Oh, I would, yeah, I, I would lose my mind. I, it's impossible. So you're seeing, uh, sitting in the same spot over and over, <laughs> the same, same motion day after day. I mean, that would just drive me crazy. What, what about you guys? Could you do that? Anybody do that? I mean, I, I worked in retail, but they didn't. We never. Had, that was, you know, in the Stone Age, we didn't have scanners. So you just you bring them up, you know, two ninety nine. You're not a beep beep. That's like worse than la 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 la. I mean, what earplugs are for? <laughs> right, right. They might actually. They, you're right. They might actually have earplugs. People might start to use that. Because I, I, I really don't think I, I could do that. I think that would drive me um, insane hearing that. But that's where they're getting the data from. So. What happens is the market research firm is they contract with these retailers to get all their data. So they want to know how many, how many Snickers bars did that particular retailer sell in all their stores. And what they do is they combine that data with how many Snickers bars were sold um, at other retailers. See, what they do is they combine all the data of how many Snickers bars were sold at all drugstores. So, Zach, we could look at that and just say, well, 
what percentage of candy bars sold were Snickers in just drugstores. But what we can find out through that data is by retailer. Because would you want, if you were the retailer, would you want to sell that information? Would you want somebody to know how many Snickers bars were sold at Dwayne Reed? Uh, or if you were um, the executive at CVS or Walgreens? So what they do, the market researcher is an, basically an independent third party, is they combine the data. So it's the um, company that's presumably in the candy industry or wants to be in the candy industry buys that data. They don't know by a specific retailer. They know who participates in the panel. So they know which retailers, in this case drugstores, are in the panel. But um, you can't see retailer specific data that way. But definitely you could look at it by channel, you could look at it by um, share of several channels combined. And that's why, remember we talked about Oreo, that's what the issue was, is they were looking at the data and they said that Oreo is America's favorite cookie, which means that they're the market share leader based on that data. But then their competitors went back and said, no, wait a minute, that's not really true. What about in this channel? But what about in this channel? You're not the market share leader. We sell more cookies, our brand of cookies, <coughs> in that channel than you do. So actually, everything happens for a reason. So I think it, it really worked out better for them because now they have as their tagline, milk's favorite cookie, which for that, you don't really need pillars of support. <laughs> You don't need to have proof points, which is what they were lacking with their prior tagline saying that they're America's favorite cookie is they came back, their competitors, and said, where's your proof points? What are your pillars of support? How do you justify that? And so they had a um, transition from that tagline to Milk's favorite cookie. Question? Marketing metrics? Does that make sense? So there's a variety of different metrics that we could use. Very important to determine our performance as an organization. How do we know that we're doing well? And not just relative to our own goals and objectives, but relative to the market, relative to our competitors. So that's why I gave you that example. We're excited about selling 50,000 cartons of orange juice, but that's somewhat less impressive when we realize that our competitors sold 150 gallons or cartons of orange juice. Questions? That's on page 33. Number seven. Who's going to take number seven? All right, Jason, go ahead. Okay. Step one in the planning phase of the strategic marketing process is A, the situation analysis. Right, absolutely. So A is the best answer, the situation analysis, and B is, um, step two is the market product focus, right, which is B, but that's not the first step. So B, the way it's listed here is A, B, C. So the first step actually is the situation analysis. The second step is the market product focus, and the third step is the marketing program. So A is step one, the situation analysis. And what is that? What is the situation analysis? Why is that step one? Why is that so important? What are we going to learn from the situation analysis? Okay, Joseph. So you analyze a need, trying to fill a void where they don't have a problem? Yeah, we want to identify that unmet need. That's certainly part of it. Absolutely. All right, the next question talks about SWOT which is um, an aspect of portfolio um, analysis. Go ahead. Uh, the acronym SWOT used in the term SWOT analysis stands for strengths, weaknesses, or two defenses. Right, absolutely. Any questions about that? SWOT um, is an acronym for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats.
so the first two components, strengths and weaknesses, is an internal focus, and opportunities and threats are an external focus. And we want, to, we, want, we want to understand our strengths as, as an organization, but importantly, we want to understand our weaknesses. And the reason we want to understand our weaknesses is why? Yeah, so we could turn our weaknesses into strengths. So it's not just interesting. If it's interesting, I'm glad, but it's got to be more than interesting. We want it to be actionable. So we want to know what our weaknesses are, not just for, for interest sake, but to uh, be able to turn those weaknesses into strengths, to close that gap. So we know what our weaknesses are so we could fix them. So very often when you go on an interview, <coughs> they'll ask you, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? So you want to say something about your weaknesses that are correctable and say that, well, I'm aware that um, one of my weaknesses is and I'm taking um, a class in time management. But don't say like, oh, one of my weaknesses is, you know, I drink a bottle of vodka every week. That's probably, um, yeah, I don't think that's going to be um, received very well, unless you follow that quickly by saying, however, being aware of this problem, I am in um, rehab and I believe that um, I will discontinue alcohol use in the very near future. But um, certainly um, organizations, that it's very common for them to ask you what are your strengths and weaknesses. And so for, as an organization, we want to understand our strengths and weaknesses. Our strengths, we want to leverage. Our weaknesses, we want to turn into strengths. We want to correct those. And we want to understand where are the opportunities and the threats in the marketplace. And we'll do a SWOT analysis for ourselves, right, as, as an organization. But we'll also do a SWOT analysis of our competitors. How is that helpful? Why would we want to do a SWOT uh, a SWOT analysis of our competitors. Yeah, we want to know what their weaknesses are. Now, it may not be that easy to determine what their weaknesses are, but we certainly want to try and identify and understand where they're strong, where they're weak, what are opportunities for them, and where are threats in the marketplace for their organization. So it's a very helpful model. And we could explain, um, basically in one page, as a matrix, in one word, well, usually a sentence, I would think, not just one word, but in one line, um, list the strength. We have five strengths. We can list those in five lines. And so it could be on one page. So our entire analysis could be on one page. Now, we could supplement that with supporting documents, but what's very compelling when you submit that to your manager or an executive is that in one page they could view the matrix and digest the information which is something that you should try and do when you're sharing information with your manager or executives in an organization, is try to be concise. You always need to have an executive summary. So it's okay if you submit a document that's 150 pages, but provide an executive summary of two to three pages of what the entire report is about and your conclusions or your recommendations. So SWOT is really very compelling. 
In some ways, you might think it's sort of simplistic, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, but it's actually very insightful and can be very profound depending on the level of our analysis that we do. And that's talked about on page 40, which is part of the portfolio analysis. All right, next question, number nine. Who's going to be number nine? In the 1980s, a lapse in production quality and increase in Japanese imports drove the Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Company to the brink of bankruptcy. The company's share of the U.S. super heavyweight market, that is, motorcycles with engine capacity of 800 cubic centimeters or more, collapsed from more than 40% in the mid-1970s to only 23% in 1983. So they went from having market share of more than 40% to only 23% in about 10 years. So they lost about half their market share. However, by 1989, Harley Davidson controlled some 65% of the US market. And both in the United States and overseas markets, the companies won't be able to meet demand for years. So demand significantly exceeds supply in this case. From a marketing perspective, what was the most likely first step in Harley Davidson's resurgence? So when they realized that their market share went from 40% to 20 something percent, and then within five to six years went back up very dramatically to about 65%, what do you think enabled them, in part, to achieve that type of improvement? Go ahead, Alan. Performing a SWOT analysis. Right. So they did a SWOT analysis to understand what are our strengths, and we're going to build on those strengths, and where are we weak? Where are the gaps? Where are development opportunities? And what they did was they fixed them. They fixed the weaknesses. And where there were opportunities, they capitalized on them. So this is a good example of a company that could use SWOT analysis as a very powerful tool, like we were suggesting. But remember, information is only potential power. Very often people say information is power. Well, no, it's really only potential power. It's only power if put to use. You see what I'm saying? So it's not just so oh, that you have all this data or you have all this information. You have to do something with it. It's got to be actionable. So you do a SWOT analysis, great. But we don't just get credit for doing a SWOT analysis. We have to take the learning from the SWOT analysis and act upon it, which it sounds like that's what um, Holly Davidson did in this case. Questions about that? Number 10. Who's going to read number 10? Max, go ahead. Number 10. Uh, points of difference refer to A, talking points and advertisement that emphasizes part benefits. B, actions responsible for planning, for the planning gap. C, situations where two departments within the same company have opposing views as to how a product should be managed. D, unique strengths with relative competitors that provide superior returns, often based on quality, time, cost, and innovation. Or E, benefits of standard graph, nepotism, or tourism to gain an edge in the marketplace. Um, Uh, D, unique strengths, relative to competitors that provide superior returns? Correct.
We need to be familiar with these two terms. Points of parity and points of difference. So Max tells us that points of difference are those areas that are strengths relative to our competitors. So the points of difference are where we are unique relative to the competition. The points of parity are those aspects that we have in common with our competition. Now, why would you think that it's important to have points of parity? Why is it important, and let's see if we come up with an example, why it would be important for us to have points of parity? Because you might think, we always talk a lot about differentiation and points of difference and the unique selling proposition and how that's a competitive advantage. <coughs> but what I'm suggesting here is that while that's important, don't get me wrong, while it's important to have points of difference, while we need to differentiate ourselves, and certainly branding is a big part of that, because our brand is what's wrapped around the product, and certainly the brand is a very compelling way to differentiate one product from another, but points of parity are also important. Go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, um, I think that uh, by by uh, by getting your points of parity, by identifying your points of parity, it can lead you to, to find where your points of difference will be. Meaning that if you if if two phones if the phone service understands that like we and another phone company both sell the same type of phone, we can say how are we going to make a point of difference? Well, let's make a, a certain package. That'll, be, that'll give us a competitive edge in the marketplace. We'll offer the phone for cheaper, and we'll give more things, we'll give a cheaper bill with that phone. So that, that leads you to your point of difference to make you, to give you a competitive edge. Interesting, so you guys got what Jacob is saying. He's saying, before you can determine what your points of difference are, first you need to find out what you have in common. Once you know what your points of parity are, then you can decide how you're gonna distinguish yourself, how you're gonna differentiate yourself from your competitors. What else? Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, Joseph. I think it's important not to be too extreme <clears throat> in terms of your difference. Like you could have, even if like Apple, which is probably the most common popular laptop, or iPhone, if it looked so different than other phones, <clears throat> people probably wouldn't buy them. If you went with this new design, it looked all different, it was funky. People might say, yeah, it's an awesome system, but it's so different than everything else. They sort of want consistency with everything, so that's important. And, but, and so what I want to understand is why in some categories having points of parity are more important than others. So Joseph is saying that sometimes being different is not good. And what I'm saying is that, yeah, having points of parity is important. What, in what situation would that be? Go ahead, Aaron. I mean, if that's your weakness, like if they're better than you at something, and that's one of your weaknesses, you may want to try to not copy it exactly, but kind of take the same formula they use so you can become one of your strengths as well. And it's harder for the consumer to like, because let's say you have a better marketing program, but let's say they have a better tasting orange juice. So you kind of copy the taste a little bit, be like, oh, I like this brand better more because they're marketing better. And they taste the same. Interesting. Um, yeah, it could be. So, um, what about an example? Can we come up with an example? Uh, another example? So, uh, from, from me, I can see my phone and his phone. He has an iPhone. So basically, we both have smartphones, but, uh, but let's say my plan is up in, is in, up in a week from now, and iPhone just came out with an iPhone 5, then the iPhone wants to have some kind of parity through other smartphones, so the user of a Samsung can have some similarity with the iPhone, or vice versa. And so why would that be important though? Because so, so the customer has some sense of comfortability, that's even a word, that with, the, with their new phone. Yes, there's going to be new stuff in the iPhone that they want to get comfortable with, but as long as they have like, the basics that they had with this phone type of thing, then they'll be, feel some sense of comfortableness. <laughs> yeah, with the with the new phone, so it's good to have parity, just so the customer feels good about what about their decision and buy. Could be. If you look at another company, yeah. 
if you look at a competitor's point of difference, what would they have that is, um, um, that with their strength that is relative, relative to you, it's probably a good idea to, to make that point of parity. Because if, if it's working for them, then you should probably, is that, is that what happens? You take it from, from like you? Well, once you know what their points of difference are, I see you're looking you at it from that, another angle now, too. Is that into your points of parity? Is working for them and their competitor. You might. Um, then you're uh, taking a me too um, approach, and some companies do that. They look at the market share leader. Whatever the market share leader does, they um, try to copy that. Or, for example, if you notice, like um, when they open up a McDonald's, now. You might think, oh, they just opened up the McDonald's on a certain street, just by chance, just random. But actually, they've done a lot of research to select a, a high traffic location. And then once they open up there, then what happens? You notice, like Burger King will open up. right, now, I'm sure that they didn't do research. Once they see that McDonald's is there, they know McDonald's has spent a lot of money doing research to determine that that's an ideal location. And then you see Burger King opens up, Wendy's, White Castle. And that phenomenon is actually known as clustering, where you'll see, um, in this case, like certain fast food restaurants together in a given location, <coughs> which has uh, become very common, actually. Yeah, another example. Something that we already used once in class is uh, like you could say that if you have orange juice and milk, uh, there the point of parity between them would, would well, point of parity between them would be that they're both beverages you have in the, in, in the morning. So orange juice to try to get the edge, use the point of difference, which was that to to really push this uh, that it has a little bit more calcium than, than milk because they they realized that one of the like, they looked at we were both beverages that people use in the morning. People might prefer milk over us. And milk might have a point of difference over us because it's a healthier beverage in the morning. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit more calcium and that way we can get the edge. So they looked at their point of parity and, and understood what they are and got to see their point of differences through that and then made their point of difference the right away in order to get uh, to see ahead. So they tried to um, make their point of difference or yeah, no, actually, I see what you're saying. You're saying that the, the point of parity is that they want to have at least the same amount, if not more, calcium as milk. Yeah, so in that category, yeah, I think that's a good, um, a good example that um, sort of the minimum requirement of the customer is that they want to drink a beverage in the morning that's high in calcium and high in vitamin A and D and so, um, if you're going to be a morning breakfast beverage, then, yeah, you want to achieve that, um, that level of parity with them, with the substitute beverage. Yeah, I think that's a good example. Um, I'm not sure if this really works, and I may not be understanding this perfectly, but is it, does this also work that they, um, sometimes points of parity um, are important and different, uh, having too much difference is bad, I'm not sure if, um, if he was saying the same thing, where in the case of the Nissan Cube, the car that looks no, very... Jason, you mean? Yeah, yeah right. That, that's Jason, this is Jacob. Right, so Jason. Okay. Um, where if you, if you make things too different, people aren't going to like the... Um, they're going to want similarity, so if, if it's too different, people are going to stay away from that kind of thing. Is that... Um, they might. I mean, it depends on the category. You know, um, sometimes having a, something that's different or unique is a reason why people purchase a product. Because they want to have something that... Um, like a sports car. Yeah, that's something that nobody else has. Um, they want a car that um, is yellow, for example. Not that that's so outlandish, but um, blue is America's favorite color. So. Uh, you think a lot of people own blue cars, black cars, white cars, red cars, but yellow, not so, not so much. That doesn't mean that we can't have a yellow car, but maybe that point of difference is a reason why somebody would purchase that product <coughs> because 
um, is of there, the color. Is there ever a case where there's too much difference that people just stay away from? Because um, of the difference? It could be, and in fact, that could be the reason why somebody purchases a particular product. In fact, in luggage, maybe you noticed this um, oh, right. in the mall, where they have suitcases in the window. And they have suitcases, for example, that might be like some sort of like um, um, hot pink, for example, like a really hot pink color. And that gets people's attention. But when people go to the store, right, they saw the hot pink suitcases, like, oh, wow, that's so cool. And they go in the store, but and at the end of the um, visit, they end up leaving with um, black luggage or brown luggage, but the reason that they purchased the black luggage is in comparison to the hot pink, right? That was like you're saying, like that was like too maybe for them, like too far fetched or too flamboyant, so they ended up buying taupe luggage or, or, or some other color that maybe was uh, more neutral, less flamboyant. But understand how the retailer uses that to draw people into the store and to create foot traffic. Because when you see that, you're like, wow, that's, you want to go in and see. And, but then afterwards, very often, people will um, not purchase that. But that's what gets people to, to come into the store. And you're right. So I think maybe that's too different relative to standard luggage um, in the industry. Anybody else? What about in terms of point of parity? Um, let's say the point of parity is safety. What do you think? Is that, do you think, let's say in, um, remember last time we were talking about uh, pain relief? What do you think? Is safety or something being safe to use an important point of parity in the pain relief category? Probably, yeah. yeah. So do you see how that's like the minimum requirement? The point of parity. What is it that all brands of pain relief have? Is that they're safe to use. That's the minimum requirement. Then you have points of difference. Then you have, well, some you have to take one pill a day. Some you have to take two a day, three a day, four a day. Those are points of difference. Now, if your medication only requires that you take one a day, that's certainly a point of difference that you want to emphasize. Because really, I mean, who wants to take four pills a day? If you can, wouldn't you rather take just one pill a day? What do you think? No, that doesn't, um, you guys would rather take four pills a day than one? No. What about you take a vitamin in the morning? They said, no, instead of just taking one vitamin in the morning, now you have to take four vitamins a day. I think um, most people, if they had a choice, they would want to take less pills. So um, being able to take one pill a day instead of four is a compelling point of difference in that category, or how fast the medication takes effect. So in some cases, you take the pill, it works in 30 minutes. In other cases, it works in 60 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes. Those are points of difference. Now again, if yours works in 30 minutes, that's a point of, parity, a point of difference that you want to emphasize. But the point of parity certainly is that the minimum requirement is that it's safe to use. So you see how that would be an example of a point of power that all competitors in that category have in common, is that the product is safe to use. Does that make sense? Oh, and that was uh, question 10.